Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of The Practice, Shipping Creative Work by Seth Godin. He said that 99% of life is just showing up Woody Allen. One of my favorite books is The Practice, an easy-to-read guide to putting our best work into the world. There is no guarantee in creative work, but there is a pattern of success. What's the best course of action? Just show up and keep practicing creativity every day. Entrepreneur, podcaster, and creativity expert Seth Godin is the author of this book. All creative people who want to change the world through their work can benefit from the practice, shipping creative work. Godin believes that while we are all born with the ability to be creative, honing that ability takes time and effort. We can overcome creative blocks rise to the top of our field, or even turn our passion into a career if we have the right mindset and process in place. However, it's not always easy to be creative. Fear, doubt, and a sense of inadequacy are all part of the creative process, so it's no surprise that they go hand in hand. Our creative work is too important to be left to how we feel on any given day, go Don Wright. Consequently, we must befriend our inner imposter, let go of perfectionism and accept criticism and be grateful for constraints in order to thrive. It's a great book if you want to boost your creative self-esteem, overcome your inner imposter, and deepen your creative practice. We'll take a look at Godin's definition of what it means to be creative, and we'll look at some of his practical advice for reviving our creative powers. As Godin puts it, it doesn't count if we don't share it taking Bruce Springsteen to a new level. Is there a person you look up to in the arts? Bruce Springsteen is the boss for Seth Godin. Springsteen had a rough start to his career before glory days. Bruce Springsteen's autobiography makes it abundantly clear that he rose to fame through skill rather than natural talent. Springsteen's first two albums were flops. The audience walked out, his first agent simply stopped answering his phone calls, and his bandmates gave up and went their separate ways. This, however, did not deter him. As a performer, Springsteen was unrelenting. Mistakes occurred during his early performances, the concerts were not well rehearsed. However, over time, this authenticity and rawness became a draw card for him. Boss fans have come to know and love him as a hard-working, blue-collar boss. Springsteen, on the other hand, is not an outlier. Almost all established artists had to release multiple albums before they found their true calling. The Beatles were a seven-year overnight success by the time they hit the U.S., writes Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers. To be creative in any field of work is to remember this, practice is what matters. In the words of Seth Godin, the careers and working processes of creatives are similar, their output is different, their circumstances are different, and the timing is different, but the practice remains. Do the work, be innovative, and then deliver your product. If you follow Godin's blog, you'll get a new post in your inbox every day. Godin writes his blog post at 4.30 a.m. and ships it to his readers. That's what he does on a daily basis. When he doesn't feel like it, he still shows up for it. Godin is a highly accomplished and innovative businessman. He's the author of 19 best-selling books, the creator of the acclaimed Akimbo Workshop platform for creatives and entrepreneurs, and the creator of the globally well-known 30-day Alt-MBA course, among many other accomplishments. Godin, more than anyone else, possesses a creative license to instruct us on how to be creative. Humans are born with the ability to think creatively. We just need to be willing to show up and be consistent with our creativity. We, on the other hand, tend to turn our backs on opportunities to be generous, solve problems, or pursue our passions. Reasons for this include, but are not limited to, it's possible that we believe that creativity comes from a mood or feeling that strikes, or a talent that is only available to a small number of people. Creativity is viewed as a fragile magic trick or as a divine gift from the muse by many people. In Godin's opinion, this isn't how things should be. Is there any magic in the creative process? That's what Godin says. It's so much easier and more powerful to do creative work once we admit there's no magic. It's simply a matter of putting in the effort, even if we don't feel like it at the time. Creativity is the result of consistent practice. And the way we approach our practice is also important. Our practice must be professional if we want to grow as a creative person or turn our hobby into a full-time career. If we don't show up, do the work, and then ship it to our intended audience, we have failed. It doesn't matter who your audience is at the beginning, even if it is your mother. First and foremost, we must clearly define what we mean when we say shipping creative work. Because if you don't share it, it doesn't count. In contrast to a cog in the machine, a creative problem solver and generous leader who creates new ways forward, 
you're not just a cog in the machine. Work, on the other hand, isn't a pastime. In the long run, it might pay off. Creativity requires practice, as Seth Godin explains. Even though it is simple, don't confuse it with easy. How often do we make excuses to avoid putting in the time and effort necessary to complete a project? Often, this is due to our desire for perfection or our belief that we are an imposter. On top of all that, we're afraid of being stung by harsh criticism or think there are too many restrictions on how we can create and deliver our work. Produce, since we aren't machines. So many people have a misunderstanding of what it means to be creative. Painting, drawing, and performing are not the only forms of art. Creative risk-taking is defined by Godin as art. Something nice to show gratitude for. The kind of thing that will have an impact. When we're able to create something new that affects someone, we call it art. Change without art. They are problem solvers who come up with a novel solution to an old problem. Painting, singing, and poetry are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to creativity. Creativity is how we carry out our daily tasks, participate in meetings, and, as leaders, make a difference in the world and society. That's why Godin uses generosity as a synonym for generosity in his definition. He's implying that we're devoting our mental and emotional resources to the benefit of someone else. Being creative means doing something that might not work in order to make things better for someone else. By its very nature, it is ambiguous. It's possible that we're not bringing much creativity to our work if it becomes too safe and routine. In Godin's words, if we succumb to our fears, we become a hack, a hustler, or just another cog in the machine. Hacks, hustlers, and cogs are all terms used by the author to describe the types of people who operate within the system in an unintended manner. Creatives must be willing to take risks and give freely in order to succeed. But if it isn't shared, it doesn't count. Ship your work. We're creative because we put our work out there for the world to see. In shipping, we are able to unleash our creative potential because of the structure and routine. Gooden's concept of creativity is based on generosity. Shipping is generously sharing our creative work, which enables us to realize our full potential as creatives. As artists, our motivations for creating are driven by three things intention, empathy, and curiosity. Are you trying to reach a specific audience with this work? And for what purpose are you doing all of this? We might conclude that the work is for everyone if we think about who it is intended for. However, by attempting to please everyone, we end up pleasing none of them at all. The people we want to serve need to be very clear in our minds. Is there a person or group of people you want to reach? Which of the following are on their mind? Whether or not our audience is supportive can have a significant impact on our ability to succeed. They need to make us work harder and think outside the box. They encourage us to take risks and hold us accountable for our promises. Second, we need to decide on the purpose of our creative endeavors in the first place. For what purpose is the film being made? Our final destination and the creative roadmap are still a mystery, but two things are certain. Who and what we're working for must be figured out before anything else can be accomplished. We'll know if we're shipping to the right people and for the right reasons if this test comes back positive. Sharing our work helps us to grow as artists. You can say, here I made this, when you send your work out. For me, it's significant, and I hope it will be for you, too. To ship is to be responsible for our goals and the people we serve. We know how important it is to meet deadlines, so we do our best to do so even when we don't want to. Godin stresses the importance of actions over feelings. It's through shipping that we learn to be more confident and grow as people. It's important to be clear about who we're trying to help what we're trying to accomplish, and when we're going to do it. However, there will be nothing to ship if we don't put in the work. Work. For the simple reason that it isn't a pastime. As long as we want to be paid for our creative work in the future, we need to treat it like a business. In order to be professional, you have to put in the hours and ask for compensation. You can only achieve success if you put in the effort. When you put in the effort, you'll get the satisfaction that comes with it. When you put in the effort, you'll find satisfaction. Working hard is the most important thing. When Godin gets tough, this is where he shines. We don't use our practice time to get ready for the game. The game is in the preparation. Practicing is what we do each and every day when we enter our workspace, close the door, and sit down to work on our creative vision. We should practice for at least an hour each day. If you have to, get up earlier or stay up later, but make the time. As long as we treat our work as a hobby, we'll never be able to achieve our full potential. Treating our creative outlet as a job means that we can both enjoy our work and be paid for it. Generosity isn't always a free service. We can still hold ourselves up as professionals. Impersonate others. 
Have you ever doubted your abilities or abilities? To whom shall I entrust this responsibility? Isn't there a more qualified person out there who could handle this? This could go horribly wrong. Could it be that I'm a fraud? This voice is familiar to most of us. If we're being honest with ourselves and admitting that we're not the best person in the world at what we're trying to do, then the answer is yes. What we try might not work, so we need to be prepared for that. We are, in fact, fakes. That's a good thing, by the way. The term imposter syndrome, coined in the late 1970s, refers to the voice in our heads that tells us we have no business raising our hand or taking our place on stage. And it's a voice that's here to stay in today's workplace. 40% of the workforce has a job that requires creative innovation, human interaction, and decision-making, according to recent studies. As a result, just under half of the working population will undoubtedly experience feelings of insecurity. One must be an imposter in order to be creative. It's a part of Godin's creative philosophy. In order to improve something we're doing, we're going to feel like we're doing something that we don't know how to do well. There is no way to know if we will be successful. There is no guidebook for the creative process, there are no tried and true methods or prescriptive guidelines. We learn by doing, and we discover what works and what doesn't. Maybe we should stop assuming that being an imposter is something to be ashamed of. I think it's a great sign that we're being innovative. Let go of the need to be perfect. As writers, we've all been there. We've all been there at one point or another. While staring at a computer screen or a blank piece of paper, you may begin to wonder if the muse will ever return. A cultural construct, however, is what amuses Godin about a creative block. There is no such thing. Why, then, do we sometimes find ourselves unable to tap into our creative juices due to a lack of inspiration? In a nutshell. Perfectionism. Creativity can't flow when we're consumed by the pursuit of perfection. Having a perfect idea of what our product or creative work will look like at the beginning of the process is doomed to failure. In the end, we won't know when our work is perfect enough to ship or whether we'll keep postponing because the task ahead is too daunting. Drew Friedman, a cartoonist, can serve as a role model for us. As a frequent contributor to The New Yorker, one might assume that he could whip up a quick cartoon and get paid handsomely for it. At least that was your impression until you saw the photo of his desk, complete with a jumble of discarded cartoons. Our unique trash piles may contain a wide range of items, but we still need them. We won't see our yes pile if we don't build a no pile. High standards aren't a bad thing but striving for perfection has a different vibe. Permission to be raw, messy, and uninhibited as you send your creative gifts into the world can help you overcome perfectionism, which can stifle your creativity. The desire for perfection is fueled in part by our fear of criticism, but if we're going to ship our work, we should learn to embrace rather than fear criticism. Criticism is a good thing. We send out our creative work with the best of intentions, hoping that our audience will enjoy it. Artists know that this isn't always the case, though. Criticism is a part of the creative process for everyone. Both of us. There is a wide variety of criticism, however. It's difficult to find constructive criticism. There is criticism from those who have not achieved their own goals, and those who are well-meaning but negative out of concern for us. Then there are those who lack the ability to give constructive feedback or who aren't our intended audience. But, as Seth Godin puts it, generous critics are priceless. These are the people we need to build relationships with because they understand our goals and have the time to analyze them. Our supporters can be found here. So, seek out the less well-known but thoughtful and generous critics and take their advice. Under constraints, creativity soars. You must complete this task by tomorrow. No one wants to hear that at work. Despite our best efforts, we are always constrained by the constraints of our environment. Constraints do not always hinder creativity, says Susan Kerr, according to Godin. They actually do the opposite. Even if we don't realize it, most of us are familiar with CARE's work. People were able to learn how to use personal computers thanks to her icon design for the Macintosh in 1984. With Apple, she was required to design the computer's user interface, but she had to do so within a strict set of guidelines. With a 32 by 32 grid to fill in, she had to work with an early computer's low resolution screen to create a black and white icon design. However, she was able to make quick decisions while working within these technical limitations. She didn't have to wade through a slew of colors or choose from a variety of fonts. She was able to see what was possible because of the limitations imposed by technology. As a blogger who has penned more than 7,000 blog posts, Godin imposes strict rules on his writing. He couldn't keep up with his daily blog schedule if all of his posts were three-page essays. Having constraints forces us to make decisions and act on them. Inevitably compromises must be made, 
and mistakes are to be expected. It's normal to make mistakes and make adjustments when creating something that has never been done before. To sum it up, when it comes to success, it's not about what we achieve, but rather how we go about it. We can only measure our worth by our dedication to our path, not by our successes or failures, says Godin's friend and author Elizabeth Gilbert. What matters is our daily commitment to our creative endeavors. In the morning, we may not feel like doing the practice, and if we do, we may not have the same enthusiasm the next day. In any case, the goal is to show up. We run if we decide to become a runner. It's up to us if we want to blog. Because we don't have the time or reason to haggle with ourselves, making this decision frees up some of our mental energy. The debate has already taken place. We came to a decision. As a result, the time has come to take action. For Godin, feelings are irrelevant when it comes to creativity, only actions count. Why not enter into a partnership with your own creativity and take responsibility for it? Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.